When my sister Betsy and I were kids, our family lived for a while in a charming old farmhouse. We loved exploring its dusty corners and climbing the apple tree in the backyard. But our favourite thing was the ghost. We called her mother because she seemed so kind and nurturing. Some mornings Betsy and I would wake up and on each of our nightstands we'd find a cup that hadn't been there the night before. Mother had left them there, worried that we'd get thirsty during the night. She just wanted to take care of us. Among the house's original furnishings was an antique wooden chair, which we kept against the back wall of the living room. Whenever we were preoccupied watching TV or playing a game, Mother would inch that chair forward across the room towards us. Sometimes she'd managed to move it all the way to the centre of the room. We always felt sad putting it back against the wall. Mother just wanted to be near us. Years later, long after we'd moved out, I found an old newspaper article about the farmhouse's original occupant, a widow. She had murdered her two children by giving them each a cup of poisoned milk before bed. Then she hanged herself. The article included a photo of the farmhouse's living room with a woman's body hanging from a beam. Beneath her, knocked over, was that old wooden chair placed exactly in the centre of the room. I lived in a house from hell for four years, from age 11 to almost 16. There was constantly something happening, doors flying open and shut, voices, footsteps. Nothing ever stayed where you put it. I was alone there a lot because both my parents worked and I was constantly terrified. One of the most gut level disturbing things though was the little girl in my bathroom. Every time I walked past my bathroom door, which was constantly since it was right outside my bedroom, I saw a little girl with blonde curled hair and a rose colored dress. She just stood there staring, looking like a photograph from 1905. I started keeping the door closed so I could walk by without seeing her, but she was always there when I opened it. Once I stepped in past her, I couldn't see her anymore, but I could feel her there. She scared me, but I felt really sorry for her because she was trapped there just like me, but probably forever. As the years went by and things in the house continued to get worse, she started seeming darker. I started feeling like she wasn't really a little girl. I knew there was something ugly in the house and I felt like it was presenting this sympathetic image to me. Then I started thinking I was completely losing my mind. One day when I was 14, I had a friend from out of town come and stay with me for a week. I hadn't told her anything whatsoever about the house because I didn't think she would come if I did. Right after she got there, we were sitting in my room and she left to go to the bathroom. About a minute later, she walked back in with a puzzled look on her face and said, So, there's a little girl in your bathroom? Um, uh, yeah. She hangs out in there. Blonde hair? Curls? Pink dress? Yeah. You know that's not really a little girl, don't you? I almost threw up. I was so relieved and terrified and excited and ready to run out of the house screaming. She wouldn't use my bathroom for the rest of the week and I started using it as little as possible without pissing off my parents, who didn't want to believe. Eventually we moved out and I could not have been happier. I distanced myself from it mentally as much as I could. Then when I was 18, I took another friend on a road trip to pack up a few things I'd left at the house. My parents hadn't managed to sell it and wouldn't for another five years. The minute we got on the property, my friend seemed uncomfortable. When we came around the bend in the long, steep driveway, he went completely white. I could tell something was wrong, but he insisted he was okay, so we got to work. After a while, he asked to use the bathroom and I directed him to mine. Not 20 seconds after he left, he came running back in, gasping for breath and slammed the bedroom door behind him. He started babbling about a little blonde girl who isn't really a little girl. All of a sudden, he went dead still, looked me in the eye and very solemnly said, she's not happy, with you. You left and you weren't supposed to. We threw whatever we could grab in two trips in my car after I walked into another bathroom and waited outside the door and got the fuck out at top speed. I hate it when my brother Charlie has to go away. My parents constantly try to explain to me how sick he is. 
that I am lucky for having a brain where all the chemicals flow properly to their destinations, like undammed rivers. When I complain about how bored I am without a little brother to play with, they try to make me feel bad by pointing out that his boredom likely far surpasses mine considering he's confined to a dark room in an institution. I always beg for them to give him one last chance. Of course, they did at first. Charlie has been back home several times, each shorter in duration than the last. Every time without fail, it all starts again. The neighbourhood cats with gouged out eyes showing up in his toy chest. My dad's razors found dropped on the baby slide in the park across the street. Mum's vitamins replaced by bits of dishwasher tablets. My parents are hesitant now, using last chances sparingly. They say his disorder makes him charming, makes it easy for him to fake normalcy and to trick the doctors who care for him into thinking he is ready for rehabilitation. That I will just have to put up with my boredom if it means staying safe from him. I hate it when Charlie has to go away. It makes me have to pretend to be good until he is back. Last night, a friend rushed me out of the house to catch the opening act at a local bar's music night. After a few drinks, I realised my phone wasn't in my pocket. I checked the table we were sitting at, the bar, the bathrooms, and after no luck, I used my friend's phone to call mine. After two rings, somebody answered, gave out a low, raspy giggle, and hung up. They didn't answer again. I eventually gave it up as a lost cause and headed home. I found my phone laying on my nightstand, right where I left it. This is a story I was told by my friend, and for the privacy of the people involved, I will be changing names. My friend's mum looked after a little girl called Abby, who was about eight years old. Abby was known to be a very energetic and lively young girl, and she absolutely adored swimming. Every single time that she had a swimming lesson, she would get home from school, pack her swimming bag and wait by the door until it was time to leave. One summer, Abby excitedly accepted an opportunity to stay at a summer camp. She really looked forward to doing all the activities and seeing new people and making new friends. However, when Abby returned, she was a lot quieter and a lot more fatigued than usual. Her parents put it down to the fact that she probably stayed up till midnight on most nights talking to her new friends. But then, that started happening. Abby would wake up screaming in the night and her mother would come running into her room. She would ask Abby what was wrong and Abby would reply, Mum, there's people in my bedroom. Her parents decided she had most likely watched a horror movie during the summer camp and decided that she would probably get over this fear. But she didn't. Every night she would scream until her mother came in and wouldn't go to sleep until her mother lay beside her. Abby didn't want to go swimming anymore. This is what particularly worried her parents. This little girl loved to swim. It was what she lived to do and every time a swimming lesson would come up, she would just come home and be quiet. She wouldn't gather her things, she wouldn't be excited for it, she just didn't want to swim anymore. The sleepless nights had clearly worn her down and she didn't have much of an interest in anything. Worried, her parents took her to a counsellor, and another counsellor, and another counsellor, but none of them could figure out what was wrong with Abby. Believing that the events were far preceding an overactive imagination, they took her for a brain scan. And nothing. Abby's brain was absolutely fine. There was nothing abnormal with it. Abby's mum confided in one of her friends, who offhandedly suggested an exorcist. Abby's mum wasn't convinced, but at this point she would try anything. A woman came round to check out the house and possibly cleanse it. Not that Abby's mum and dad believed in ghosts, but what else could they do? If it was nothing psychological or neurological, then what else? The moment the woman stepped into the house, she looked dead in Abby's mum's eye and said, you do realize there's about 40 spirits in your house. While Abby was at school, she performed a cleansing, a basic one to get rid of any nasty spirits that may have been around. They didn't want Abby to see this happening because they didn't want to burden her with thinking she'd done something wrong. When Abby came home from school, she was a lot more relaxed and she went swimming. Her parents were absolutely relieved. 
and they spent a good few more nights in complete bliss until it started again. They called the woman back in and she was absolutely perplexed that her cleansing didn't stick. This time Abby was present and the woman sat down next to Abby. Abby, when did this start happening? Um, when I was at summer camp. Did anything happen at summer camp, Abby? Yeah, we played a game. What game? Charlie Charlie. Way back in the early 1800s, a man named John Bell moved his family to an area in Tennessee called Red River, which is now known as Adams, Tennessee. After they had settled in the new home, some peculiar things started happening. The Bell family began hearing some bizarre noises, including dogs barking, chains rattling, rats chewing, and a woman whispering. Soon, that woman became known as the Bell Witch, and many people believe she's the ghost of a former neighbour of the Bells, Kate Batts. Bats and the Bells had a dispute over land, and she had sworn vengeance on the Bell family before she died. Later on, Bell died from poisoning, and it's rumoured to be the work of the Bell Witch. At night, I usually go to the bathroom multiple times, but for the past four days, every time I go to leave, I can see myself still standing in the mirror from the corner of my eye. It is like the other me is watching me leave the bathroom. It terrifies me to the point where I almost run out without looking directly at the mirror. I never told my husband about it because I didn't want to acknowledge it out loud. Earlier today, I took a nap in our bed while he sat in the chair next to it watching TV. When I woke up, he told me that he had seen me sit up and crawl backwards to the edge of the bed and stand up in front of our bedroom door from the corner of his eye. He thought it was weird that I got up like that because I'm in the last month of my pregnancy and I can't really move so good without it hurting, so he tried talking to me. When I didn't answer, he looked at the door to find me not there and still sleeping in bed. I got really creeped out and I finally told him about what I have been seeing in the bathroom. He thought it was creepy as well, but didn't want to really talk about it anymore because he thinks it will give whatever it is power or energy. I have no idea what it wants or why we both saw it. One night, when I was maybe 10 or 12, I had trouble falling asleep. My bedroom was the entire top floor of our house with my bed and such being on the left side and storage in closets and a play area on the right. I was lying in bed when I heard a noise from the other side of the room and saw a rocking horse begin to rock. It was sitting just outside one of the storage closet doors. It proceeded to rock its way halfway across the room and stopped dead under the ceiling light. At this point, I was freaking out and just buried my head under my blankets and never peeked out again until morning. When I woke up, the rocking horse was still in the middle of my room. Furthermore, I got a stern reprimand from my parents for being up out of bed playing with my toys well past bedtime. Their bedroom was directly below the storage closet slash play area and heard the creaking shuffling across the room. I didn't grow up believing in ghosts. Then one morning when we were 16, when my mum's friend picked us up for carpool, I mentioned that I was really creeped out by this bathroom under the stairs in my house that no one ever used. I couldn't exactly define why I felt this way, I just found it eerie. The house I grew up in was an old Victorian home built in the 1800s, so eerie vibes were part of the package. Hearing this reminded my friend of her own creepy bathroom association. She told me that when she lived in the German countryside for a year, there was a little section in the home that no one but her middle sister used, who was about nine years old at the time. During this time period, her sister would wake up with bloodshot eyes, sometimes even bruises, and felt totally exhausted. They did everything to investigate what was going on, including sleeping in her room, working with a child psychologist and a school counsellor. My friend doesn't remember much from this time period other than her sister being disturbed by something the year they lived there. She mentioned that she and her other sister, the oldest, also hated using that bathroom because they would always feel off and find thick black hair stuck in the drain, even though they both had fine blonde hair. At this point in the story, my friend's mum abruptly stopped the car and jerked her head around and said, that's where the woman who once lived there killed herself. 
She drowned herself in that bathtub. Her mum was clearly shaken. She said that part of the reason they moved was because they felt something was off in that house.